All right, so what did the negative label on the power source or battery mean? Why did the physics people label the outside terminal of the battery negative? Yeah, electrons are coming out of there, right? So the electrons here on the battery on the power source are coming out of the negative terminal. So they're headed towards that electrode. And they labeled the other electrode positive because it was attracting, they thought, electrons. So they, you know, the electrons are headed in that direction. Now you're right, if electrons are headed towards the positive terminal, then something on the left-hand electrode is, is losing electrons, right? So we could we can label that positive because you're losing electrons, right? And if electrons are entering the right-hand electrode, that electrode would become negatively charged, right? So the question is, which of the electrodes is the cathode? Why is an electrode called a cathode? It attracts cations, right? So which one of those is going to attract cations? The one on the right, right? Because cations are positive and they'll be attracted to the negative electrode, right? Okay. So the right hand electrode is negatively charged, it attracts cations. And what's going to happen to the cations when they hit that electrode with all those electrons there? They're going to get reduced, right? They're going to gain the electrons. So reduction is going to happen here, isn't it? So let's go label that. That is the cathode. Reduction will happen there. This is the anode oxidation will happen there. What's in the beaker here? What's in the beaker? Anybody? So it says molten, molten salt died underneath. And what did molten mean? It's not in water. It's just a melted salt, right? So the temperature has to be extremely high. What is not in that beaker that usually is? Yeah, there's no water present. So the only things in the beaker would be sodium cations and iodide anions, right? And can you draw little arrows? What direction are they going to go? What direction does the sodium ion go? What direction does the iodide ion go? Well, sodium's a cation, it's positive. It's gonna head to the cathode, isn't it? Iodide's an anion, it's negative. It's gonna go to the anode. So what's going to happen at the cathode? Sodium ions are gonna get reduced. What's gonna happen at the anode? Iodide ions are going to get oxidized. So write the equation for the half reaction that occurs at the cathode. You could look on a chart for that, but I hope you would just use your brain. If Na plus gets reduced, it's going to gain electrons. It's going to gain one electron. It's going to become... And A. I don't need to look on a chart for that, right? The anode is a, is a little bit trickier. The iodide ion is going to lose electrons. And as it loses electrons, what will you get as a product? It's going to form iodine. But why is it tricky? Hofbrinkle? Yeah, it's a, it's a diatomic. It's a Hofbrinkle element. That's right. So it's going to form I2, 
which means we should start by balancing by putting a two in front of the iodide theoretically. And then that means it doesn't lose one electron, it loses two electrons, right? When you balance that. Now you could have just taken that right off the chart as well, but it's not hard to figure that out. Okay. Any questions about that, folks? So molten salts, we said yesterday were straightforward because there's only two things present, a cation and an anion. The cation goes to the cathode and gets reduced, and the anion goes to the anode and gets oxidized. So there's very little debate about what happens if there's a molten salt being electrolyzed. Look at number eight. And what do you see in number eight that is immediately a little bit more complicated? Yeah, this time the beaker contains aqueous nickel fluoride. So the first one would have had to have been done at some extremely high temperature to melt the, the compound. This could be done at room temperature, right? It's just, it's just a solution of the nickel fluoride. So let's indicate the charge on each electrode, just like we did in the last one. The electrons will come out of the negative terminal of the battery. There is no, <laughs> there's no convention to put the negative on the right, on the right and the positive on the left. So I could easily give you a picture with those reversed, right? So don't just memorize it. They always go, no, they don't. They go, they come out of the terminal that's labeled the negative. And depending which way you were looking at it, it could be on the left or the right. So they, in this case, again, they come out of the right-hand electrode of the battery, making the right-hand electrode in the electrolytic cell negative. And the electrons will head back to the positive terminal of the battery and that makes the electrode on the left positive. If electrons are coming in on the right-hand side, something's going to gain those electrons. That means it's a reduction, right? If it's a reduction, it must be the cathode. Notice I just explained that in the reverse of the last one, right? Instead of saying, oh, it's negative, it attracts cations, we said, oh, electrons are going in. Something's going to gain electrons there. That's reduction. Oh, electrons are coming out of the other electrode. So something's losing electrons. That must be oxidation. And that must be the anode. Part B says, show the movement of three different particles in the cell. I guess technically four particles, but three different kinds of particles. Ryan, what, what are the three particles, three kinds of particles that are floating around in here that we care about? So nickel with what charge? Be more specific. Look at the formula, NIF2. So it must be nickel two positive, right? Because fluoride is a negative charge. And then there's also the fluoride that I just mentioned. So there's two particles. And what's the third one? Yeah, there's water molecules. Now, the water molecules, I'm going to draw two of them, right? As I draw them, I'm going to draw them in different orientations. So on what, and there's an O and there's two H's. So draw one of them with the O on the left, then draw the other one with the O on the right. What direction does nickel go? It's positive, so it's going to go to the cathode, right? The fluoride is negative. It's an anion, it's gonna to go to the anode. Now in my diagram, I drew the first water molecules, oxygen on the left, and it's hydrogens on the right. So 
what happens to that water molecule? Can it go left or go right? Doesn't matter, right? <laughs> you can draw it either way. If I it can go this way because the positive hydrogens are attracted to the negative electrode. The other guy, I guess I drew this backwards, right? I should have drawn in the same direction. In any case, this guy's negative oxygen is going to be pulled towards that electrode. I was a bit too clever when I drew them oppositely. So water gets pulled to both electrodes is the point. Okay, what are the two possible half reactions at the cathode? Can you do one of them without looking at your chart? The other one, you probably want to look at the table in your data booklet. So which one can we do without looking? Yeah, the nickel. So nickel two plus, what's going to happen to it? It gains two electrons because it's two plus. Then it becomes nickel metal. Now I do want to look on my chart because I want its potential, don't I? Grab your data booklets. Find a data booklet among the piles of paper on my desk. I had a data booklet here. I'm not seeing it. All right, so somebody help me. What is the reduction potential for nickel? Negative 0.24. Negative 0 0.24, thank you. And then we want water's reduction potential, don't we? Or water's reduction equation. You're probably gonna to wanna to just look that up on the chart, but do you remember what gas gets produced when water is reduced? Maybe not, but what gas would get produced with waters oxidized? Oxidized. It, it produces oxygen when it's oxidized. So that it must produce hydrogen if it's reduced. But there's O's in water. So what else would have to be produced? Is it hydroxide ions would have to be produced? And then to balance this, are we gonna to need to put two hydroxides and two waters, I guess? Is that right? And then the electrons would be what? Two electrons, just looking at the charges, right? You could just copy it off your chart. What's the reduction potential for water? Is that negative 0.83? I'm going by memory. Is it negative 83? So negative 0 0.83 volts. So what do I now know when I look at those two reactions? Which one happens? Which one happens, Trevor? The nickel will happen. Why does the nickel reaction happen? Because it has the higher potential. Right, so of the two potentials, they're both non-spontaneous, but, but nickel's got the higher potential. So nickel will get reduced and water will not. So on my cathode over there, I'm not gonna see any bubbles of gas, am I? I'm not gonna get any hydrogen gas produced. I'm just gonna see nickel metal precipitating on the surface of that electrode. So do the same thing at the anode. Well, the fluoride could get oxidized. And if it does, it's a Hofbrinkel element. It'll make fluorine. And fluorine's a gas. And it'll make two electrons. But water can also get oxidized. And when water gets oxidized, it creates oxygen gas but it also produces acid, right? Hydrogen ions. 
So if we balance this, we'll need two waters, we'll need four hydrogen ions, and then we'll need four electrons, wouldn't we? To balance it, you could just copy it off your chart. Mac, what's the oxidation potential for fluoride? And isn't that right at the very bottom of the oxidation potentials, right? Which means what? It's not going to happen, is it? Right? It's, got, it's going to have the lowest oxidation potential. And water, I'm going by memory, is it negative 1.23? Negative 1.23 volts. So the higher potential is the one that happens. So the water reaction happens. So technically there's two products at the anode, but what's the one that you would see? Yeah, you'll see bubbles of gas forming on the surface of that electrode. Those bubbles of gas are oxygen gas. What would happen to the pH inside the beaker? Will the pH go up, go down, or stay constant? It'll go down. Why will it go down? There's an increase in hydrogen uh, concentration in the water. Yep. And with more hydrogen hydrogen ions. ions, it's more acidic, and that'll mean lower pH, right? That's correct. All right. One more before we learn something new. What's the Faraday? What is it? Well, it is a constant, but, but what does it represent? What, when we say that the Faraday is 96,500 coulombs per mole, what is that actually telling us? So it's the charge on one mole of electrons, right? So there's 96,000. 500 coulombs per mole of electrons. It's a good idea to not just say per mole, but to put per mole of electrons, and then you can pronounce it per mole. Did you get that, Ivan? Good joke. Per mole, because there's an accent aigu. That's French, sorry. Okay. I got it, Mr. Pato. Don't Thank worry. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's go back to our notes. We're going to learn some calculations today. So you need a calculator. What we did yesterday and what we just reviewed, you might call qualitative electrolysis. Qualitative because there's no calculations involved. What we're about to do is quantitative electrolysis. Quantitative electrolysis could be the title if you want to put a title down. All right, so at home you can see the PowerPoint. Looks good. So don't waste time writing down the flow chart on the left because that would just encourage you to memorize, and I don't want you to memorize. We're going to use unit multipliers, and as I hope you now understand, unit multipliers, you don't need to memorize formulas or steps. They just kind of flow in front of you, don't they, when you use unit multipliers. But the formula on the right, that's a useful formula to know. Um, we're not going to use it, really, maybe once or twice, but it's going to be rarely used because we're going to use unit multipliers. But from that formula comes an important unit multiplier. So you should write it down. So Q is the capital Q there is the symbol for charge. And it equals IT, capital I, and little t. The capital I is the symbol for current, electric current. And a little t, not a big t, is the symbol for time. So q equals i t, current, times time, gives you charge. 
when I see that formula, I think of the word quit. Right. That reminds me of sort of like what everybody should do when they take physics. Just, just quit. <laughs> Good joke. Yeah, quit because it's physics. Okay. Q equals IT. The charge has units in SI, the international system. They're called coulombs. We, we know that. Time, the units would be seconds. So we always have to use seconds for time. Current, well, current, you have two choices. The, if you look at that, if you rearrange the formula, doesn't current equal charge divided by time? Yeah. When you rearrange it like that, you might even want to write that down. Current equals charge divided by time. When you write it like that, it tells you what current is, doesn't it? What is current? Well, since it's charge divided by time, it's the rate at which the current, the charge flows, isn't it? So charge divided by time. Current is how fast the charge is flowing through the circuit, right? Coulombs per second. But coulombs per second is a little bit awkward to say, and current, and current is a very important thing. So we give it its own name. So the unit for current is ampere, named after another Frenchman. So amperes, and this is the important thing, when you see amperes, you should say in your head, coulombs per second. You might even want to put an example down in your notes. If a current is 5.0 amps, 5.0 amps, you will immediately translate that and say, oh, no, no, it's 5.0 coulombs for every one second. And then what have you just turned the current into when you write it as five coulombs for every one second? You've just turned it into a unit multiplier, haven't you? Right? So current is a unit multiplier. If you give me coulombs, I can tell you time. If you give me time, I can tell you coulombs with the unit multiplier. We're also going to use the Faraday and look at how I wrote it. I wrote it like that to remind us that it is also a unit multiplier. 96,500 coulombs for every one mole of electrons. So if you give me coulombs, I can tell you how many moles of electrons. If you give me moles of electrons, I can tell you how many coulombs of charge. Another tool that we're going to use in most problems will be the half reaction at that electrode. Right? Why do we want to use the half reaction? Because from a half reaction, you can then tell me in another unit multiplier how many moles of electrons because half reactions show you the moles of electrons, don't they? For every mole of product or every mole of reactant. Okay, you'll see that in just a moment. So let's jump in. Copy that question down. What mass of aluminum could you produce in electrolysis? This is electrolysis we're doing of molten aluminum oxide. Think about that for a minute. Molten aluminum oxide. You'd be producing aluminum at the cathode and you'd be producing oxygen at the anode, wouldn't you? If you did electrolysis of molten aluminum oxide. So we're going to run a current of 100 amps. And I was a bit lazy with my sig figs there. I think we'll consider it three sig figs, 100 decimal amps. I'll say amps, but you can see the symbol there is technically a capital A. And we're going to run that current for eight minutes, 8.00 minutes. Can someone criticize my language in that question? I've used this slide now for several years, and every time I use it, I say, I should change that. There's a word in there that's not a good word to use. I think the word mixture. Yeah, it's not a mixture, right? Aluminum oxide is a pure substance. It's a compound. So really, I should just say through molten aluminum oxide. Right? It's not a mixture. Right. All right. 
I'm going to use unit multipliers to solve this question. Before we do that, let's remind ourselves, what does 100 amps mean? Yeah, so 100 amps is 100 coulombs per second. We're also forming aluminum. The question's asking us for the mass of aluminum. We're forming aluminum by the reduction of the aluminum cation, right? The cation in aluminum oxide is gonna get reduced to make aluminum. So write down the half reaction. Aluminum three plus gains three electrons to make aluminum metal. And what does that half reaction tell me that I'm gonna to need to know? For every one mole of aluminum, there are three moles of electrons, yes. Right, that's what the half reaction is gonna tell us as a unit multiplier. So what should we start with? in our unit multipliers. There's 100 amps, but there's also eight minutes. Which one of those should, should I start with? Mm -hmm. The minutes? Yeah. Why should we not start with the amps? Because, because the, amps are unit yeah. like the amps will be a unit multiplier that will convert the time into coulombs, weren't they? So let's start with the time. Let's start with eight minutes. What will you do first? So don't put any other numbers in right now, just put your units in. So yes, take your eight minutes and convert it to seconds, okay? In mine, I'm gonna put the numbers in, but just, just put your units in at this point, right? So switch minutes to seconds. Then what? Now that we have seconds, the, the current, right, has seconds and coulombs, doesn't it? So we can convert seconds into coulombs. We can convert the time into the charge. That'll be the next multiplier. Now that we have coulombs, now that we have charge, what could we convert that into? Okay. Alan's on a roll here. Yes, we can convert it to moles of electrons. How? What, what would we use to convert Coulombs into moles of electrons. Isn't that the Faraday? There's 96,500 coulombs and one mole of electrons. So, yes, we're going to use the Faraday next. Now, don't just write mole, okay? People who write mole will usually make a mistake. What will they do wrong if they just write mole? They're going to go, yeah, we have moles. Let's just go get grams, right? But but no, you can't do that because you don't have moles of aluminum right now. You have moles of electrons. So make sure you put the label. So next, we're going to convert the moles of electrons to moles of aluminum using the half reaction ratio, right? You can argue that's stoichiometry. So we're going to use the half reaction. We're going to convert moles of electrons to moles of aluminum. And the question asked were the mass of aluminum. So the molar mass will be the last unit multiplier, won't it? Convert your moles to grams. Use the periodic table to get your molar mass. Once you've got all your units in place, then put all your numbers in. So 60 seconds in one minute. When you say it, instead of just putting the numbers in, it's hard to put them in the wrong places, right? People sometimes put the 60 in the wrong spot. The current was 100 coulombs per second. So the 100 will go beside coulombs on top. The Faraday is 96,500 coulombs for every mole of electrons. So 96,500 goes beside the coulombs, doesn't it? The balanced equation says three moles of electrons. So the three goes on the bottom beside moles of electrons for every one mole of aluminum. And the molar mass, 26.98 grams, so that goes on top. You might, in your notes, want to label the unit multipliers. You don't have to do that every time you do a question, but for studying purposes, it might be a good idea to label the unit multipliers at least once or twice. 
the 100 coulombs per second, well, that was the current in the question. The 96,500 coulombs for every mole of electrons, that's the Faraday. We used the half reaction to get the ratio three to one. And we used a molar mass at the end. If you are going to memorize things, which, you know, it's not a bad thing to memorize some things, you should memorize the tools you have to do these questions. The tools are the current, the Faraday, the half reaction, molar masses. Then when you need to solve a problem, you don't memorize that flow chart you saw on the first slide. You just know these are the tools I have. Those are gonna be my unit multipliers, right? And the multipliers will just unfold as you reach for whichever tool you need. So this is 4.47 grams of aluminum. Let's try something related. Can you calculate for me how many, right, you might wanna write this down. Calculate for me how many liters of oxygen gas, how many liters of oxygen gas would be collected in the same experiment or would be produced in the same experiment, what do I need to tell you if I'm going to ask you for the liters of oxygen gas? No, not the volume. You're going to find the volume of oxygen gas. What am I, what do I need to tell you though? Great electric pressure. Say again. Did someone say something at home there? Unit. If it's at STP. Okay, so you need to know the temperature and the pressure, don't you? Right? And if it's, if I give you, if I say to you that it's at STP, that would be easier, wouldn't it? Because then you have a unit multiplier that can help. If it's not at STP, then what do you need to use from grade 11 chemistry? You'd need the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. So, so let's not do, let's not do STP. So, Tell me the volume of oxygen produced at 20 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius, and let's say 98.0 kilopascals. So 98.0 kilopascals, 20 degrees Celsius. What volume of oxygen would have been produced in this experiment? Okay, go ahead and see if you can figure that out. There's a longer way to get this answer and there's a shorter way to get the answer. The shorter way because we've already done the first part. We already know the aluminum. But the longer way would be, let's just do a string of unit multipliers just like we did for aluminum. Um, Mr. Patnode, how do we make your screen bigger? Because we still see the uh, PowerPoint. Right. I, I'm showing you. No one in class is seeing my work yet, Tom. Gotcha. <laughs> nice try. You're doing this yourself. All right, so doing this basically the way we just did aluminum, you should have done something like that, right? The only difference would be after I had my moles of electrons, I used the oxygen's half reaction. So I had to think about that. 
O2 minus from the aluminum oxide is becoming oxygen, which is a Hofbrinkle element, O2. So I had to balance that by putting a two in front of the O2 minus and then balancing it again, four electrons on the right-hand side. Do you all understand that? Now that I have that half reaction, my last unit multiplier, I'll switch the moles of electrons to moles of oxygen, and it's a one to four ratio, isn't it? Why am I going to stop there with the unit multipliers? So I'm going to stop here and get moles of oxygen, yes, so that in a separate calculation, you, you, you wanted to know the volume, we're going to use the ideal gas law, aren't we? So PV equals what? PV is NRT, and we want to know V. There's not much grade 11 chemistry from the gases unit that you really need on the AP exam, but the ideal gas law is one big thing, yes. So something that's fair game. So using your calculator, however, how many moles of oxygen are there? 0.124. People agree with that? Silent, yep. yes. Looks yeah. good. 0. 0.124 moles of oxygen. What's R? <coughs> what is R? The ideal gas constant. Whoops. And what is its value? Well, it depends, doesn't it? It depends on? On the units of pressure. The units for pressure, yes. We're going to use kilopascals. The question said 98.0 kilopascals. So if you're using kilopascals as pressure, well, no more, can you use kilopascals in the ideal gas law? Yes, right? And what's the other unit you can use? Atmospheres. Now, technically, you could use whatever pressure unit you want, as long as you know the value for R that goes with it. But we only know two values for R, and those are the two pressure units. What's the value for R for kilopascals? This is the SI version, right? 8.314. And I'm usually lazy. I don't put the units for R. I just put the number. And temperature, do we just put a 20 in there? You got to put Kelvin, right? So instead of 20, it's 293 Kelvin. Okay. Now, what if this had actually been STP instead of this other temperature and pressure? If it had been STP, we could have tacked on another multiplier, couldn't we? Does anybody remember? If it's at STP, then one mole of any gas would have a volume of 22.4 liters, right? Arguably, you could have still done that even in this question, and you'd now know the volume at STP. You could then use P1, V1 over T1, P2, V2 over T2, and you could then find the volume at the new pressure and temperature if you don't want to do it this way. So what's our volume now? Somebody at home, what's the volume going to be? 3.08. Say again? 3.08. Okay. Is that Colin? 3.08 yeah. liters? Do we agree with yeah, that? Yeah, liters of oxygen. Thank you. All right, so that's a fair question of me to throw at you. I expect you to know the ideal gas law and how to use it. <clears throat> now, I said there was another way we could have done this question. Looking back at the, la at the aluminum question, how many grams of aluminum was there? 4.47. So you could have said, you could have written a balanced equation that said aluminum oxide Go back here. Aluminum oxide, you might want to write this as an alternate way to do the question. It makes aluminum and oxygen, right? This electrolysis, this is what's happening. 
and balance it. So you're going to need two here and three here, and you're going to need a four here. Now, can we get moles of oxygen in a in a quick way? Was it four point four seven that we said grams of aluminum? Since we've already done that, and we know there's 4.47 grams of aluminum, can't we just do stoichiometry and figure out how much oxygen there'd be? We'd get rid of grams of aluminum, switch to moles of aluminum. Then with one more multiplier, switch your moles of aluminum to moles of oxygen. the molar mass of aluminum. And from this balanced equation, four moles of aluminum for every three moles of oxygen, that should give you the same answer as this, 0.124 moles. Okay. So there's another way to have done. Are we good? All right, so yep. let's, try, let's try another question then while we share the screen here. Try that. How many minutes if you need to deposit 10 grams of copper? from a solution of copper two nitrate using a current of five amps. How does this question compare to the last one you just did? Isn't this just the reverse question? The last one gave us the time and the current and it asked us how many grams of aluminum. This one's giving us the grams of copper and the current and it's asking us how long will it take? So it's just going to be a string of unit multipliers, but in reverse, isn't it? What's something I need to notice in the question that some people may not notice? What's something in that question right now? I can see it. Some people may not notice and or even appreciate the importance of it. Anybody? Would it be the charge on the copper? Yes the charge on the copper, because it has two nitrates attached, the copper here is copper two plus. So why do I need to notice that? So I can write the half reaction, right? So go ahead and write a half reaction, copper two plus, and I know it's two plus because it's got two nitrates attached and nitrates are minus one, right? So the copper two plus is gonna gain two electrons and become copper metal. Now I have everything I need. Jump in and set up your unit multipliers. Dylan, what are you starting with in this unit multipliers? Say again? The 10 grams, yes. Okay, so 10 grams of copper. We need a thing to start with. Convert your grams of copper to moles of copper. Ariel, what will you convert moles of copper to? To moles of electrons, right? Using the half reaction? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. 
Fanny, what will I convert moles of electrons into? Say again. To coulombs, right? Using the Faraday, right? Then when I have coulombs, I can use the current, right? To convert to seconds. And then it wants minutes. Convert your seconds to minutes and you're done. Right, so that's what your string of multipliers should look like. And there's your answer. So if you're understanding permutations, you realize that there's one more version of this question, isn't it? right? Instead of giving you the amount and the current and asking the time, or giving you the time and the current and asking for the amount, what's the third permutation here? I can give you the amount and the time and say, what current should you use, right? That one is arguably a little bit, little tiny, tiny bit harder because you may not be able to do that in just a string of unit multipliers. You will use unit multipliers, but you may end up having to go find your coulombs and then, what well, maybe you could do with it and then just divide by the time. So yes, you, I guess you still could do it with a string of multipliers. Whoa, look at that. So this question is harder on several levels. It's about 10 minutes, let's finish with this. So it is that third type, what current would you need? But it's got all this other stuff happening here. So what current do you need if you wanna make two liters of hydrogen gas by the electrolysis of water? in 30 minutes. Oh, look at this grade 11 chemistry coming back at us. The gas is going to be collected over water at 25 degrees and 95 kilopascals. And at 25 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 3.2 kilopascals. Ooh, a lot of stuff happening there. Anybody with a very, very good memory of your, was it gases unit? I think it's a gases unit, yeah. What, very good memory of the gases unit. When you see that this hydrogen gas is being collected over water, did anything from our gases unit in grade 11 strike you right there? Alan yells it up. Dalton's law of partial pressures. Can you explain, Alan? Uh, well, Dalton's law said if you have a mixture of gases, the total pressure is the sum of the pressures of each gas in the mixture. That's Dalton's law. Right. How does that apply if you're collecting hydrogen gas over water? Some of the water, so the water, some of the water will evaporate to loosen. Uh, water vapor. For those at home, Alan just said the water, a little bit of water evaporates, producing water vapor, which okay. means you're, you don't have just hydrogen gas, you have hydrogen and water vapor. So when it says that the room pressure is 95 kPa, anybody remember doing this last year? Or maybe, I guess you guys were at home remote, right? Do you vaguely remember if you're collecting gas over water, you have to make the level of the meniscus inside the test tube where you're collecting the gas. If, if that meniscus is equal in, in height to the level of the water outside the test tube, 
Remember this? If the level inside and outside are equal, what does that mean? It means the total pressure in the test tube is equal to the outside air pressure. Yes. So if the inside meniscus, do I need to draw that or do you understand what I'm saying? If you're collecting water, the hydrogen gas in a test tube by water displacement, the water levels dropping, dropping, dropping. When the water level in the tube equals the level outside the tube, then the pressure inside is equal to the pressure outside, right? So when you're finished in electrolysis, you would make the levels equal. Then you could argue the pressure in this tube is now 95 kPa, right? The total pressure is 95 kPa. Then you would use what, what uh, Alan just said. If the total pressure in the tube is 95 kPa, how much of that is water? 3.2 kPa. So then how much is hydrogen? You get the idea? So go figure out hydrogen's vapor pressure. Oh, sorry, not vapor pressure, pressure. Start by doing that. So Dalton's law. Let me walk you through that a little bit. So start by finding the pressure of the hydrogen gas. Take the total pressure and subtract water's vapor pressure. This is Dalton's law. 91.8 kPa is the pressure of the hydrogen. At this point, I'm gonna let you see if you can figure out the rest of it on your own. I've given you the equation right off your data booklet. Water produces hydrogen gas at the cathode during electro electrolysis. Now, can you finish off the question? I'm gonna pause the recording and let you work on that for a little bit. All right, so the first thing we're doing once we've accomplished Dalton's law, I guess the next thing we're doing is we're using the ideal gas law. Moles is PV over RT. So there's 0 0.0741 moles of hydrogen gas being produced here. So next, we're going to set up a string of multipliers, starting with that. What am I going to do with the time? At, at some point in my unit multipliers, what is current again? It's the charge divided by the time. So when I set up my unit multipliers, at some point, I'm going to simply divide by the time. And then I will convert the time to, to seconds in my unit multipliers. So let's start with the moles of hydrogen. What will we do with that? So looking at the balanced half reaction, convert it to moles of electrons. Then what? Moles of electrons, convert that to coulombs using the Faraday, right? And now you know you're close because what is current again? It's Coulomb's divided by time. It's charge divided by time. So once you get your Coulomb's, then you just divide by the time. And then wait, it was in minutes. So you could either do it, what Alan's been saying, you could have converted it to seconds before you divided or just divide by the minutes and then switch the minutes to seconds with another multiply, right? Or you could do what I did here. You could use formulas, right? I don't like to use formulas, but there's another way to show it. So you just saw three different kinds of questions there. This last one is definitely a much higher level problem than the, than the first two, but that pretty much is quantitative electrolysis. And I think I'm gonna look tonight to be sure, but I think we're now done. I think this is the last thing we need to do in electrochemistry, which means we're essentially done the course. 
so I'm going to um, <coughs> post one more web assignment on electrochemistry. It'll focus on electrolysis. We will practice with the worksheets in class tomorrow. That's Thursday. Um, Friday, we'll, we'll see. I'll figure out something for Friday. Uh, there will be an electrochemistry test. When would you like it? So we could do it over the weekend if you'd like. That's a possibility. Or we could use, we could do it on Monday. I could assign the, I could open the um, test at Monday morning and have you do it any time on Monday until 1130 at night or something. Yeah, Monday. That's a possibility. Or even do it on Tuesday if you prefer. Actually, no, I think Monday would be better. Okay. Next week is the last week of classes technically. Um, I'm probably going to, did, did I set a due, due date for the review? Which day? What, which day? That's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, which day? Thursday next day. So, okay, it kind of sucks, but I guess what I'll do then is I will have classes on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week. Um, Monday, I'll leave it up to you if you want to show up for class or not. Monday can be a will be the test day. So for those of you who are at school on Monday, if you want to stay here for chemistry, you can do that, or you can just go home 2.30 and do the test. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we'll have uh, Zoom classes and things in which it'll just be working on the exam review. If you want to check in for attendance and then tune out, you can do that. Um, and it has to be done by Thursday. So on Friday next week, there won't be an expectation that anybody is here at school. And on Friday, there likely won't be a Zoom class. I'll be marking and stuff on Friday and assembling my final marks. Okay. So test will aim for Monday. Enjoy your evening, folks. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good